Welcome, everybody. My name is Dion Lafoucade, and I am your host today for the There is Hope motivational series. And we have our very special guest today, Mr. Ben Martin. Ben, welcome. Hi, guys. Hi, Coach. How are you doing? Good. Thank you very much, buddy. Thank you. Thank you for coming. What we're going Thank to you. do is I'm going to just say a little prayer to start off, and then we will get the interview going. So, and please, um, you folks, um, I would love you all to ask Ben some questions, but I'd love, I'll let you guys know when you can ask the questions. Okay, so I'll let you know when it's time to ask the questions. So for the meanwhile, can you keep your mics muted? Dear God, thank you for this opportunity. We're happy that we have Ben here, one of our sporting heroes, to join us today uh, to, to give us, to share some of his insights in, into how he's reached, where, where he's reached. We also pray for people who are going through difficulties at this time. And may you come for them in Jesus Christ. And we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. So Ben, welcome, buddy. Welcome. Welcome. So happy to have you here on the Dare is Hope show. I know we went back and forth for over a month, you know, trying to get, get you scheduling and so. And, you know, as, as, I, as I got you on, I noticed that you're, you're even taking in some golf behind you. You know, you're, you're there with the masters. And we'll talk a little bit about the masters in a bit. So Ben... I'm going to ask you, my first question for you is, our theme, There is Hope. How does that resonate with you? Well, it did resonate with me in the sense that um, I think hope is something that all of us have to have in life, you know? Hope and faith, you know, they're kind of close together. So, I mean, it, it's always good to have hope, and it can, it can mean in all walks of life and anything to do with life, having hope, I think, is, um, is a, positive, a positive thing. Thank you very much. Ben, I want us to tell the, the, the people who, who are, are listening as well, and then the, the thousands of people who are going to see this when it goes online tomorrow. Tell us about your journey. How did you get from playing golf, you know, thinking about golf to actually playing golf and then representing the country? Just talk us through the journey, please. Yeah, well, um, as a young man, I probably don't even remember very well my first, first interactions with golf clubs and a golf ball and a golf course because I was so young. Um, my family, my dad and mom moved up to Mocha Heights, which is on the golf course. So we lived on the third hole. And um, at a very tender age of about four or five is when I first picked up a club and started to pull around with it and swing in the garden. And then out in the late afternoon, we'd, we'd sneak out onto the course and hit a few shots. Um, my father was a golfer and my grandfather were golfers. so. I mean, it ran a little bit in the blood. They were never like scratch golfers or, or really good golfers, but they were single digit. And in the scheme of golf, they were pretty good golfers. So the first introduction came from them. And then it kind of snowballed after that, you know, um, as years kind of went on and I progressed. It was mainly golf and football, my two sports that I was interested in. As you could remember, you were my football coach. Um and I think it got to a point where I didn't even realize kind of how good I was at golf until I played a few tournaments at the age of eight and nine. And then next year, you know, I was being asked to represent the country on a junior level. And obviously this spurs you on and gives you this sort of belief that, wow, I'm actually pretty good at this thing. And and it kind of just snowballed from there, really. But that's how the, um, the, the start, start happened. Okay. Um, and that's well said, Ben. And when you were like, let's say in primary school, you know, going into secondary school, was it in your mind? Yes, you know, okay, you live you live near a golf course. Was it in your mind to represent the country or was it that you took it step by step or, it, or did it just happen? I mean, how did that work out? It, I first represented the country on a junior level as a reserve on the team at the age of eight. So, I mean, when I look back at a picture of myself on this chubby, small little boy and I the memories are very vague. They're very kind of the vivid sort of. I really have to go back in my memory bank to actually remember those times. But there are some really good memories, and it's it's not that that was my intention at the start. And I think as it happened, I think the next year it gave me incentive to want to be on the team. I'm not a reserve for the team, and then yeah, as years progressed, I was a a strong figure on the team, and I would say I'd, I'd worked my way up to be a role model on the team and someone that. People eventually looked up to on, on that junior team. And was there a point, Ben, you know, when you were um, younger that you said, ah, this golf thing, you know, this is for me, you know, yes. And I know your parents are very supportive. And was it that, you know, 
a tournament, you, you, you didn't get the, you, do, you didn't you didn't get the scores that you wanted to get. Was there any point that you had some doubt about playing golf? I think all the time. I mean, um, I sometimes question if I want to play football or golf. Um, because football, I was quite a good footballer myself, a, a centre midfielder. I, I really love the game, and um, I had a real passion for football as well. I think all sports I had a real eye for, and I could play anything that I put my mind to, and and sporting wise, right? But it was more football and golf, and I mean the commitment sometimes with with golf. The difference is it's an individual sport. So a lot of times I'm on my own, I'm practicing on my own, all the investment, the, the time and and stuff came from myself. It wasn't like going to practice with a team and you had buddies that could kind of pull you along and, hey, let's go and sweat and let's go and do this. Kind of golf, you have to motivate yourself. And, and I was lucky that I had quite a few friends that also played golf. So we played golf together, which made it a bit of a lime as well. Because, you know, when you're young and you, you also wanted to be fun, right? So... I mean, there was there was sometimes doubts, and then eventually I remember dad telling me, like, hey, son, uh, in football, you have to rely on a team. You say golf, you're in full control. So, I mean, as years went on, I, I started to take golf more serious. I would say from the age of about 15, I really kind of put football a bit on the back burner. Okay, I used to go and sweat little five aside and little kick arounds and stuff, but nothing too serious until football, actually, when I moved to England for a few years. I started back playing a little bit of football, but it was just on the side kind of thing, and I got a knee injury. And I could just see my dad looking at me now and saying, you see, I told you, like, you know, you got to be careful because as a sportsman and as an athlete and doing something I'm passionate about, it's hard to go into something, a game like football, and go 50%. It's either all or nothing. And obviously, when you're putting it all on the line, you're more susceptible to get injured and these kind of stuff, especially in, in football. Um, so that kind of set back my golf career a little bit and even put more doubt like hey what did I just go and do there playing football to my knee how is this now going to affect my golf career going forward so I had to do a big um, ACL reconstruction on my left knee um, some physio and rehab for that it's still not 100% it's not like Papa God made it but it's it's good and it's strong and I'm lucky enough to be able to still compete and, and do what I love Um. But yeah, I mean, there's there's always doubts, but I think I think with doubt you kind of have to ponder on the thought of it, and then kind of kind of reassure yourself on positive things and ponder on the thought for a little while, and just get it out of your head, you know. Because doubt is good, but it's it's how you use it, you know. So Benny said you you went to England. Did you go to England for golf, or was it that you would you? How did you end up in England? Was that for a golf? Was that a golf move? So I I um I actually I finished my high school year in Florida. So I actually lived in Florida for a year before moving to England. While I was in um the IMG Academies at Burlington in Florida for my high school year after leaving Maple Leaf, um I got a full scholarship to the that golf school, which is amazing. So it was a kind of no-brainer. So I shipped off straight to Florida without much sort of warning, you know. Even I didn't even get to have my friends sign my t-shirt in Maple Leaf because it was like a you're gone, you know? So it happened quite quick and I was in Florida and then mom and dad actually moved, the whole family moved up to England. Um, dad was a pilot and he ended up getting in with a, a job as a captain as he liked in England. And for for family purposes and personal reasons, I guess we the whole family decided to make a move to the UK. So after my year at, in Florida, I went to England to sort of have a kind of gap year before going to University of Central Florida, which was my intention at the time. I got a, a bit of an offer from them as a scholarship, which was pretty good. It was a good golf school, D1 at the time. And I went up to England to um to see mom and dad and play some golf during the summer. And then the story takes another turn. Hit. I end up playing a really good summer of golf. And next thing you know, I have David Olcorn from the English Golf Union calling me. Is this Benjamin Martin? I would like to in, in, invite you to an England golf training camp. So next thing you know, I go from going on a visit to play golf in England to seeing mom and dad to getting a call from the English Golf Union after having a really solid summer of golf. Obviously, I was recommended and, and put on by like, like a coach or a scout, you want to say. And next thing you know, I was had an English rose on my chest playing golf in England. On the amateur level, that is. So it was it was a real wild whole year. Um, 
I remember having to make a call to Ashraf Ali, our president of the Trinidad Labour Golf Association at the time, and say, look, Uncle Ash, I just got a phone call from the manager of the England golf team asking to say for me to come to a training camp. And he said, well, why are you calling me? He says, a no-brainer. He said, England have 60 million people or more. He said, by all means, go and do it. So being born in England, because that's, that's the part probably I miss now, which is a little confusing to maybe the viewers, is that I was born in Chichester in England. So even though my family is Trinidadian and, and grew up here, I, as the eldest, was born in England. My mom had her first child, if you want to say, with her mom up in England. And um, yeah, so I'm a Jew citizen. I have two passports. So that's how that happened. So and, a of a while. yeah. No, that's awesome. That's awesome. So let me just bring it forward a little bit. So playing, are, are you allowed now to play? How does that work? Who, who, who you, so in terms of what country you're going to play, you play for? Bear in mind, I was 17, just turning 18, right? So playing golf, I played for the junior level and national level at Trinidad. But I also asked the question, I said, but I played golf at Trinidad for how much years on the senior level as well. He said, now that I turn 18, he said, now I'm a man and I need to decide. So I made the decision to go and represent England at the amateur level. And I played on the England team for just shy of three years until I turned professional. And it didn't feel right of me to turn professional and fly the English flag. I'm a Trini. I was born here and I still fly the Trinidad flag. For everybody who wants to know, I fly the Trinidad flag because it feels right to me. It's my heart. But I was born in England. So I used the opportunity to, to better my skills, kind of hold in my, kind of my, my direction a little bit, get a little bit of feedback from their coaches and their sort of structure. And... I mean, not everything is as rosy as it sounds. You know, playing golf in England, it sounds like, oh, wow. And it's it's playing golf with you any day. And I had five or six different coaches. I had a nutritionist. I had a short game coach. I had a long game coach. I had a putting coach. I had a mental coach. We had a fitness coach. And the game became a little bit of a, not a chore, but it became a little bit too scientific almost for me. Whereas I grew up in Trinidad doing it kind of myself I had one or two coaches who showed me the right kind of way and it kind of maybe took away even a little bit of my flair a little bit initially you know without without actually realizing because I was so trying to get better and do everything legit legit and to the point where I kind of lost sight of the overall picture which is how many shots you're going to have on the golf course basically so um after turning professional, I made a decision. I said, well, hey, let's let's go and play this game for money now instead of just receiving trophies and a, a well done and a pat on the back at the amateur level to let's go and try and do this thing for a living. And if yeah. you were to compare facilities, you know, what, what you were saying in terms of comparing facilities with, with what we have in Trinidad compared to what they have in England, which, but you're still saying that at the end of the day, I still feel like I should represent Toronto and Tobago. Well, I mean, it's where my heart is, right? It's where I grew up and it's it's where my heart is. And I mean, as as much as I love England as well, Trinidad is more my home. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like, I mean, how I talk. I talk like a Trinidad. I don't talk British. So, I mean, I could try and put an accent for you. It might sound very good, but... <laughs> um, So that's where my heart is. But at the end of the day, golf, you're kind of... You're kind of... I, I, Representing myself and I'm I'm individual sport as much as I'm representing my country. I have never got a great deal of help financially or or anything from my country. So it's not to say that I'm I'm doing it in a payback for someone or anything. It's just where my heart is and a, a place in the world that I love very dearly. And I have lots of good friends and family here. And it's a beautiful place besides, I mean, everywhere there's still bad things, right? But I love Trinidad. So yeah. So talk us true, Ben your experience at IMG, you know, getting that 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 um scholarship and going to IMG and you know having all these the, the, the what was what was it like if you if you could remember being at IMG for a year? Well so going back to your 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 question about the facilities, I mean seconds are none, right? They had three or four different chipping greens with different kind of grass on it, different sand in the bunkers, um uh, basically a 36 degree driving range so you could hit balls into any kind of breeze direction um videoanalysis.com i mean you name it right so facilities were blow mine and we had some really good coaches and then we were 
exposed to good golf courses, even at a junior level. So playing in tournaments that even uh, at courses, junior tournaments that even host big tournaments now, as we speak on the PGA Tour, right? So, I mean, the experience was was really good. It was structured. It kind of showed me the, the next level of what I'm trying to achieve. And I think it was a good kind of um, good foundation to start. I mean, it was the first time I lived away from home on my own at the age of 17 in a dorm room. And it was all new experiences. But I think all that is kind of part of what what kind of builds you as a person, right? And I've always been someone who travels a lot through golf. So I didn't have a problem being by myself and missing mom and dad and stuff. I, that wasn't a big issue, you know? So I really enjoyed it and, and played some good golf through it as well. Where would you say science and technology helped you? Where would you say that helped you in, in what part of your, of your game? Um, I, w- I wouldn't say too much science. I'd say technology helps in the sense that knowing what suits you and knowing your specs to certain clubs. Um, I don't find I'm very scientific when it comes to golf. I find I'm more kind of practical when it comes to golf. And I kind of leave the, the scientific stuff to the pros and the manufacturers of the clubs and I always a, a firm believer, and it's it's not the it's not the tools, it's the man behind the tools. So, I mean, those things help, but it's like people come to me sometimes for a lesson, and they say, "I don't think my driver is very good, or this is very good," and I hit it, and they say, "Well, oh, it's still pretty good." I say, "Well, it's not the club, you know, it's the man behind the club." So, um, but I think knowledge is power in anything in life. So the scientific side of it now, with this all Instagram and Facebook and how things are all out there on on videos. That sometimes you get just little pieces of information and you go, wow, I didn't realize that and I didn't realize this, you know. And sometimes, I mean, it, it is interesting to like listen to like Bryson DeChambeau talk about golf and he's using all of his irons at the same length and he now has a tapered face. So the heel and the toe is kind of tapered on his clubs. And I mean, that's really scientific. So, I mean, it's interesting, but I'm really not into the big science side of it, to be honest. Okay, so as I saw one of the, one of your photos online, you actually came back. You know, you actually you stood a pro, but you actually gave it back to, to society and encouraging young people to play golf. What is tell us what what how, what is that feeling like? Well, it was it was nice to give back to the youth. Our future generation is is something that I I take a, a lot of pride in. You know, coaching young people and being able to nurture them, like yourself, being a coach. You, you take a lot of pride in, in doing what we do, coaching, and seeing the smiles on people's faces when they get better and the encouragement. And I also wanted to kind of break the stigma around golf, that it's a rich white man sport. Because I think as time's gone on, I think that's quite silly to still look at it like that, or even look at it as an old man sport, which people also, a lot of people have the view of. And I think everybody should have the opportunity, equal opportunity, to try and see if they, they like golf. So... Any way that I could give back to the youths and the future generation to give them an opportunity to try it. Um, you never know where where it could take them, you know, even if it's to just gain a scholarship out of it, even if it's to just get out of the ghetto, to get out of crime, to get out of whatever it is, to to help anybody and give them hope, like there is hope. Oh, brilliant. Well said. Well said. I remember talking to Brian Lara and he was telling me when he just started to play golf, there was uh he just, you just kind of, he said to me, when you fall in love with it, you can't stop. Ben, explain that to us, please. Well, I, I've been in love with it since how old? Since I'm four or five. So, yeah. and I still stop. So, I um, I actually played golf this morning with two West, in, West Indian cricketers, um, Kimar Brooks and, and Hayden Walsh. And we played 18 holes. And some of these sports, when they say, boy, if I knew about golf a little earlier, because it's a really addictive game. Really, really addictive. It's a game within you and yourself. And between yourself all the time, you can't blame anybody. You can't blame your clubs. You can't blame the course. It's you, yourself, and I, right? So it's a constant challenge. And it's really hard to actually put the nail on, the finger on what actually makes it so addictive. But it could be various things, whether the challenge. Oh, shoot. Sorry. My bad. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Um... Whether it's a challenge, whether it's it's trying to better your last score, whether it's to play with your friends, whether for your fitness, um, 
but it, it really does become addictive. Even at my stage now in a professional career, I still constantly trying to get better and improve my skills to every day because it's it's not a game of perfection. It's a game of excellence. If you're a perfectionist, golf is going to be real difficult for you. <laughs> ben, you actually read my, you, you, you sense my next question because for the for the person who wants to be excellent and wants to be, you know, have, have to get everything right, why do they sometimes still continue, but at the same time, how do they overcome that? I mean, they still continue because it's like life, right? They say there's a Ben Hoven quote, I hope I can get it correct. They say sometimes in life you get, you, you get, hit a good shot and get a bad break. And then sometimes in life you hit a bad shot and get a good break. So it's about trying to marry up the luck with the skill. And golf always has a way of giving you one shot to get you coming back. You might play bad the whole day and on the last hole you hit it in the hole or you make a long putt. Or it, it, boy, it, it really is a tricky game. But golf is also something that shows you a lot about yourself. Eh? I mean... There's companies now in the States and England that I've heard are using nine holes of golf as an interview. So imagine you not knowing anything to do with golf coach and a man gives you a set of clubs and says, right, let's go play nine holes. This is your interview. And the reason being behind that is because you, you learn a lot about yourself. You learn a lot about someone's character. You learn a lot about someone's manners, about being timely with other people's shots, having respect for them, staying quiet and still, etc. And... You could kind of work somebody out quickly on the golf course. Like there's people that I thought I knew and then they played golf and I say, hey, that, I didn't realize how competitive he was. Or, you know, <laughs> you, you, you realize quite quickly who someone is when you're out on the golf course, whether you're tough mentally, whether you give up quick and, you know, so it's, it's a real challenging game, but it's a beautiful game for everybody. And I, I recommend anybody who hasn't tried to come and try it. Talk us through, talk us through, Ben. One of one of your tournaments where you your start might not have been the best, and you you know after so much so much preparation leading up into that tournament, but you didn't get a good start. And and what was that like? And then how did you overcome that? I mean, sometimes you just don't overcome it. Sometimes you may have the best preparation and you just have a poor week, and you can't really you can't really beat yourself up too bad. I mean, look at Tiger Woods. Look at the best players. They really shot eighty two yesterday. And golf, sometimes you just don't have a good week. And then there's other times where you would start off poorly and you may find something midway and think, ah, shucks, I was forgetting that swing thought. And all of a sudden you kick on and you, you finish the tournament quite well. There's other situations that the one that pops out to me is that starting a tournament really well, getting yourself in content contention and then throwing, right, throwing it right away at the end whether it be out of a little bad luck or a little misfortune, but such highs and lows that could happen instantly in golf. And for the people like myself who are not that technical with golf, you know, I, I will tell you, I like miniature golf. <laughs> right? yeah. so I fell in love with miniature golf and I'm still in love with miniature golf. So there's hope for me. <laughs> <laughs> so t t talk us through one of those, those days that, you know, what goes through your mind? Because we're obviously looking at golf on television and seeing the best golfers in the world, you know, locally and, and, and as well. And talk us through what that is like when you, you're you approaching a hole and you have to make pars this amount and under par and you want to get a book. Uh, talk us through one of these holes, please. A prime, a prime situation is I had a Euro Pro tournament. It was a three-day event. And I had made the cut. And on the third day, I was six under par through 16 holes. So I shot up from... Seven under par to, to six is 13 under par. Is 13 under par. All of a sudden, I was leading. But what had happened is I had teed off about an hour before the leaders because it staggered, right? The best tee off last and vice versa. So I was in like the fifth to last group. But I ran up the leaderboard and I had two holes to play. And the leaders probably still had about six holes to play, but I was leading. And stand up on the 17th tee, there was a cameraman who rushed on with a golf cart that came and he came behind the tee box with his camera. And it's amazing because so many thoughts went through my head in those two minutes before I hit that golf shot. The cameraman was actually so near to me, behind me, he was about eight paces behind, that my routine, when I was walking back, I actually almost bumped into the camera. So my mind started to wander a little bit. I started to question, should I tell him to move or am I going to look silly on telly like a grumpy man telling the camera guy to move? Um, X, Y, Z. And all these just thoughts, they go through emotion like, like a 
like a book, you know, when you flap a book? Yes. Okay. Just thoughts. And I guess that's how you control control your thoughts. What then proceeds to happen is I hit two shots slightly left in like kind of knee-high, wispy grass in England. And we didn't think they would be lost. They had about 30 people ahead of us looking for the ball. We didn't find either of them. I went on to make a nine on the hole. And instead of winning, I came tied 12th or something like that. And instead of winning 10,000 pounds, I won 900 pounds, of which I was fined 300 of it for using obscene language when the situation did happen. So I ended up leaving at a loss for that week after playing stellar golf for 52 holes and then had one bad hole, basically, that cost me my entire week. So that's the highs. That's one of the lows, obviously. And then there's obviously highs where you don't expect to do as well and you run through and you finish and you get yourself a good finish and make some more money, you know? So have you ever had a hole-in-one? I have. I've had three hole-in-ones and, and for the viewers out there. I'll have to admit, neither of them were good shots. They were all quite lucky. <laughs> all what? my good shots that have ended up close to the hole, they haven't gone in. I've had quite a few eagle shots and nice shots that have gone in, but my hole in ones were a bit fluky. <laughs> so, so what, what, did, what, did, what did that feel like? Oh, child, I didn't get this one right. And then all of a sudden, you, you're seeing the ball and like, wait, wait, all right, wait. Okay. So the first one I didn't even see because it was dad and I in, in Barbados at the age of 16 on the 16th hole of Durance. And I hit, I think it was an eight time, and I missed it slightly. And I said, ah, Dad, throw another ball. And he said, where you want another ball for? I just went in the hole. And I'm like, what? So I didn't even see it. The second one was in um, England, and it had a green that had a kind of slope, and it landed on the left side and rolled. And all we heard was, cats, hit the flag and in the hole. And the third one was in Shagaramas that landed, took a huge bounce, and landed straight in the hole. So they were all a bit... They, they shock you a little bit, but it's a nice feeling because it's very rare that something like that happens. And uh, that's awesome. And give us an idea in terms of a, a particular, any course. Is there a yeah. strategy? Is there a, how do you approach playing on a, any particular given course? Well, hugely, hugely strategy. It's called course management. So in golf, everybody's different in golf, just like in life. Um, some people are longer than others, the way they hit the ball. Some people are more accurate than others. Some people's short game is better than others. Some people's wedge game and iron play is better than others in certain yardages. So everybody will kind of map out a course slightly different. Um, there's yardage books that you're given in the professional game. If you don't get given a yardage book, for my juniors, what I like to encourage is that they have a, a notepad in their pocket that you can make your own notes. So when you play the first hole, on the tee, you'll make a few notes of a few a few visual stuff that you can see off the tee. Maybe a note of a line or aim at the White House or whatever it may be. Um, but it's always good to, to map out a course and have a plan for the course. I mean, that plan may also change instantly because the wind may change. So the wind direction that you played your practice round in, maybe in the breeze, all of a sudden now you're in the tournament. You look at your book and you think, oh, shoot, this is not this club anymore because now it's down breeze. So your plan could always ad adjust and change, but it's, think it's still better to have a plan because then you can, you can change your plan and alter your plan than having no plan at all, you know? And who are you talking this plan through? Is, is that yourself or is there a coach during the tournament? This how, is, how does that work for you? You and your caddy, if you have a caddy, a lot of, a lot of times at, um, at mini tour level, at, at, at even professional level on the challenge tour and other tours, you don't always have a caddy, so sometimes it's just you and yourself, and you got to make this this plan to your strengths and try and manage the game the best that you can around that golf course. So from what from what you're saying, Ben, you know, like in football, okay, if things are not going well in the first half, half time, the coach could bring you in and try to motivate you. And so, what you're saying is it correct to say you are actually? the athlete, the person taking part, but you're also the coach of yourself. Is that a fair statement? Correct, yeah. You're, you're taking part in your, of the coach of yourself on the course because you can't coach, you can't have a coach on the golf course coaching you while you play. You don't have even someone in the sidelines telling you what to do. So you have to coach yourself when you're on the course. And then when it does go wrong and a little astray, you have ways of kind of throttling it back. I mean, 
myself, I kind of shorten my swing a bit. I may grip down on the club and play some more control shots to keep it on line. Um, make sure and get it in spots that I know maybe a little more generous. So the fairway is maybe a little wider or the green is a little bigger in certain spots. So sometimes you kind of know you don't have your A game and you have to play with what you have. And it's it's a real scrap out there, right? You're real scrapping it around. And that's when you got to dig deep and really let your course management, one, keep you out of trouble, and two, your, your stickability and your good mental game and your positivity try and help you because sometimes you feel so small out there. But over the years, what I've kind of realized too is the more patient you are is when good things happen. You start to stress yourself out and get upset and you bang your club and you, ah, oh, shucks, man, and you're this and you're that, and you complain about the greens and, you oh, it's too windy and cold. That's when shit barely hits the fan, you know? Whereas if you're in there sticking ability, you eat something, you have something to drink, you keep hydrated, you fuel yourself, positive thoughts, you'll be surprised how quick you can turn around. Or all of a sudden, you hit another bad shot. It hits a tree and comes back in play perfect. And all of a sudden, you say, hey, that's a little stroke of luck maybe to make you smile and change your whole day around. And I kind of believe, I believe in God or God a lot. And I believe there's a golfing God that's always watching down on me. If you are doing the right things and putting yourself in the right situation and being there mentally and positive and stuff, he's going to help you too. But if you're getting on like an ass and you're, you're, you're kicking yourself and you're cussing and you're making yourself look silly, I don't think he's going to help you very much. He's going to make it worse for you. It's kind of snowball and spiral down. So, and we look at the best player that's ever lived in this game, Tiger Woods, and you there's talks about him and his mental game. And I think when you really look back at what kept him and, and and away from the rest is I think his mental game more than anything, more than any other attribute he had as a golf. What I love there, Ben, is that you alluded to the power of words. And one, the words that you say to yourself. And what if have you ever been in a situation where you, you're playing golf and somebody purposefully or not purposefully in in um on the golf floor said something to you could it be would it be a fan or somebody now luckily the reporter who was very close behind you didn't say anything yeah. negative yeah. you know he kind of got the hint like oh i need to move back a bit but have you ever experienced that somebody said something like you know happens in cricket or different sports yeah i mean sometimes you just get people who aren't as friendly as others and and it may even be a playing partner who, who you're, you're grouped with you're paired with who's just a bit of a moody moody guy and oh stay quiet sit still and and just tells you certain things that maybe i'm trying to get under your skin a little bit and maybe back in the day i might have i have a real fond memory of when i was 13 playing in cayman islands and there was a gentleman that i was battling with his son to win the individual title as a junior that's how far back it goes right at 13 my dad my dad and basil gonzalez and a few others would remember this story very well the guy shouted in my backswing basically on my downswing and I kind of flinched and miss hit the ball. And it was the father of the next guy. And it just, it wasn't very nice. I cried like a baby afterwards. And I'm lost by one shot. But I'm sure they didn't feel very good after the fact either. And then as years went on, zebras don't change their stripes, right? There was another situation that he was involved in that I thought, ah, you see, karma, karma's a hell of a thing. But... um. What what you do try to do in situations like that, well, what I try to do anyway, is I try to get in my own little shell and nobody can pop my bubble. So you try to just kind of focus on what you could control and what you could do. And at the end of the day, they could be wishing you bad and whatever. And you don't take them on because if you're wasting your energy and your mind space on them, they've already got in your head. So it's it's one of those things where it even puts the grit between your teeth a little more. And it's going back to even Brian Lara. When you, when you stir up Brian Lara, he puts his head down. Because, you know, so I think you got to use it, use it as a positive and you use it as a, in a sense that why is this guy trying to mess me up? Maybe he's jealous of me or scared of me or intimidated by me and use it in positive ways to kind of motivate yourself. And you so talk about it, intimid intimidation. Have you been in a tournament where you, you an international tournament where you're playing and you you sort of know some of the other golfers and this person is very highly ranked? What how do you feel in terms of wow, I'm gonna play against this person or that person? And how do you I, deal with that? I I think 
I, I'm, I, I believe that the golf and professional world is very condensed. So like the, the skill of professionals, they're all so good. It's whoever has their paper patch and their on week who's going to win. So I've realized over the years that they're not superhuman. They're not doing anything different than you are, but they're just really good at it. And they've done it over the years. I mean, a good example is last year at Q school, um, at final stage of tour school, the practice rounds, they give you a timesheet where you can put your name down to go and practice on the tournament courses before the tournament. When I look in on this tournament thing, I seen all these big bros, one set of big bros. And there was one of them, Kiradek Afi Banrat, who's from Thailand, who I look up to. He's a, a very nice guy, a lots of flair he plays with. And his name is down by himself. And I said to Timmy, my brother, I said to him, I put in my name down with him, you know. Because the way I look at it is, I can only learn. I can only learn from this guy. He's he's had four wins on the DP tour. Nice guy. And I went in there quite gingerly, shook his hand, met him, and it was like a house on fire. We had a great day. He taught me lots. I mean, he gave me some 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 good pieces of advice which I could take on into the future. And it was nice. So I kind of try and not get scared by it or intimidated by it. You try and embrace it and learn from it, you know? And and who else? You you would say that gave you some advice and it was like, this is like gold to me. This is this is, who else yeah. you have you experienced? Have you who else has I, you taught you that? Very own, very own Stephen Ames has helped me a great deal in my career. Um, a lot of my golf clubs that I use are hand me downs from Stephen Ames, where I'm blessed in the sense that we use very similar specs with clubs. So um, the equipment wise, I've always been been grateful and blessed that he helps me along with that. Um, and I mean his advice and and swing coaches and. And stuff that he's helped me with is is invaluable, you know. So I, I always forever grateful to him for, for the help that he's given me. And I mean, even playing golf with my little brother as a good player, we learn off each other. Every day you play golf, you learn something, right? Whether he learned it and tell me or I learned it and tell him. Or there's many things you always learn about golf. It's just it's never ending. Never ending. And and for you, and for you, Ben, is 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 it about the trophy? Is it about the big paycheck? Is that is, has that been a motivator for you? Well, I mean, it, I think if I said no, I'd be lying because that is the the end result, right? You want trophies, you want to have a trophy room, and you want to have a bank full of money to be able to do and live a comfortable life, and maybe even help and support others and support your family and help others in 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 your path that you kind of created in Trinidad to show people that hey, look, there is hope, and look, Ben did it. It was hard work. Look, he's still trying to do it at the age of thirty three, but. It's because I love it as a passion, which is that's what it stems from. I wouldn't do this if I didn't enjoy doing it because I really love golf. But there also there is the benefit of winning trophies and money. That is the perks, right? So I think that is in that is the incentive behind it. But it comes from a true love from the game as well. And to the to the to the young person that is that is listening now or is going to listen to this interview and says, Well, Ben inspired me. I don't want to go to school. All I want to do is play golf, and I got to play golf every day. Mom, dad, granny, grandpa, leave me. I don't want to go to school. What do you have to say with them where academics is concerned? I don't think that would be the, the way to go because I think, I mean, I myself, I only did high school. I never went to university. I did a B-Tech after to do some kind of schooling when I got to the UK for two years to kind of keep me enrolled in a college and, and still playing golf on this side. Um, and it was also some... um some A-levels I got. So it was it was used for a purpose. But I think school and discipline is very important. In life as well, it kind of shapes you as a person, teaches you the basic things in life. And I mean, being a smart person and being able to talk and converse and read and write and these things are important in life. I mean, especially when you travel on your own. I mean, it's it's nice to be able, be able to be independent. And I think through education, you gain knowledge. And I think knowledge is power. To the to the to the you, you talked about the physical side of it and you know obviously tearing your ACL and, and going through that. But to somebody looking on and says, Oh, all those golfers do is walk up and down, or they might just take a golf cart. And so tell us the physical side of it that people don't necessarily understand the physical side of it. Well, I wish I could go on my phone now and look how many steps. I, I think every day I look at my phone is like 25,000 steps. So that's just a day playing golf. But besides that, your whole body is moving because you're building up torque and twisting your entire body. So it's almost all your muscles moving. 
And it's a lot of flexibility and stuff involved as well. Um, so keeping good shape of your body is not is not overlooked. You have to keep real fit and, and flexible and strong to be able to compete day after day, week after week, because it's not like 180 holes and you're done. You're playing every day. So it's how you warm up, you're playing, and then how you cool down as well. And even afterwards, you, what you're doing behind the scenes and maybe your yoga, stretching and, and strength and conditioning, breathing skills, all sorts of stuff going to it. You could get really technical with it. And what about the diet? Is it diet? It, or you could just, if you feel to have 10 cheeseburgers, you could have it. No, diet is key. And I think I think it, it's all like, it's life, right? Everything in moderation. So, I mean, if you want to, to, to lead a healthy life, you have to watch what you eat. It don't matter if you're a sportsman or not. Um, more so when you're a sportsman, though, is how you feel yourself, right? Limiting your sugars. When when I um play a lot of golf and we're playing out there, I have a, my bottle of water. I put a little bit of squash in it. I mean, like in like in England, you use squash it, whether it be orange or grapefruit or grape or whatever. And I actually put a little pinch of salt in it. And what that does is helps you retain your water. So you're not just constantly going to the washroom and having to pee. So you just retain your water, it hydrates you a little bit and makes your brain work a bit better. If you're if you start to get hungry, it's too late. So that's what I remember from my nutritionist. And on the golf course, you have lots of time in between shots. You have to know how to switch on and off. And it's something that I actually quite look forward to do when I'm on the golf course is munch and eat and eat my snack and eat half of that, wash it on with some water or my drink. And yeah, it's it's like a marathon, right? It's not golf isn't a sprint because you sometimes you have lots of time in between shots. So it's how you switch on and off. And I think the better you fuel and hydrate yourself is the better your brain's gonna work to make everything work more efficient. And is it compulsory to walk from I just finished the 12th, but I'm going on to the 13th. Is it compulsory to walk or you, you can take a golf cart? No, you have to walk in professional events, you're not allowed to use golf carts. I think on the senior tour now, champion store, they allow golf carts, but I mean that isn't the the, the peak of your career. That's the end of your career. That's like a celebrity tour, you know. But in, in professional golf and serious amateur level golf, no golf carts allowed. And does Timmy do the, the Timmy be the is Timmy the caddy for you or you have a, another caddy? How does that work? Timmy could be my full time caddy, but unfortunately he has a job and a fiance <laughs> and or oh, and his life to lead as well, right? But if I had to choose, I would love Timmy as a caddy. My dad caddies for me now and then as well. Um I think my dad and I are quite similar. So we never kind of worked as well as caddies, but as I've gotten older, I say, look, I just need you to be positive and that's it. So we actually do work well together now, but Timmy and I, personality-wise, he's a little more quiet than I am, a little bit more outgoing and loud. And I think we work really well as a team, you know? So, but he's not my full-time caddy, no. But when he does have the opportunity, I lap it up and I say, of course, come and caddy. And then, you know? and then you guys have that. And what is that conversation like on the way, on the way up? Whether it's your dad or whether it's Timmy or whether it's a, an actual caddy that you you hire? Well, it, it's it, you you kind of you have a game plan, right? So you would have had a game plan for the course, and you're basically trying to execute the game plan. And maybe with my old man, he so I guess loves me and wants me to do well that he almost would show his emotion. So good or bad. Too much emotion in golf isn't good though, right? Being even keel is what you're looking for. You're not one of the highs and lows. That's like too much, right? Too much emotion, too much of a roller coaster. So I would just say to dad, like when we're in Q school, I said, Dad, I just want positive. I do if I have a hard shot, I don't want any stoops. I don't want to don't want any reaction. I just wanted to let's move on. Positive thoughts. And when I tell you he was so good at it to the point where he was so positive, it was like, all right, okay. You know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's it's basically just talks of what you're trying to do for the day. So even Timmy, like the day we played, you may have a situation where I go, God, but you know, I was thinking I should have done that. And he said, you know, I thought that too. I said, well, why you didn't tell me? I said, next time, he said, well, I didn't want to get in your way. And it was, you were kind of in your bubble and going for it already, which I understand is a skill of a caddy too, knowing when to butt in and when not to. And it's just little things you talk about and the kind of, Game planning, maybe a swing thought. Like I use acronyms in my my game sometimes. Like I have one for my swing, SHT, 
which is soft head and tempo, as simple as it is. And then what Timmy and I were using in the last few tournaments we played is an acronym called WIN. What's important now? And I think that just kind of helped bring me back to the present. And you would have a shot and you could, it's so easy to get caught up in thinking ahead in the future and what has just happened in the past. And I find what's important now kind of just kept Timmy and I in the present and like, hey, no matter what just happened, what's going to happen, we're we'll eating later, none of that matters. What's important right now? And I think that's a nice way of kind of, right, what's important now? As simple as it is, right? This is important now, it's hitting the fairway. So, right, wind off the left, let's aim on the left half, execute. And then after that, you get to your next shot and we might be talking, all right, hey, win, what's important now? And it kind of just gets you a little bit triggered into a mindset to already to execute, you know? Ben, your, your, your family, tell us about your family support. You talked about your dad just now, but tell us about that family support throughout the years and how has that helped you? Second to none, boy. I mean, family is, is everything, right? Um, they, they have tireless hours and tireless time. It almost gets me emotional to think about it, you know, because it's a lot. And I, without their support, I wouldn't be anywhere with, without them, to be honest, you know. So I'm forever grateful and thankful for their support. And um, I guess they know who they are, you know. So without them, and the boy will be 10 times harder and probably not even possible. So and we're, today, we're a good family unit around here and, and, and support you through thick and thin, through the highs and through the lows and tell you when you're doing crap and pull you out of this and, you know, tell you bit they believe in you. And yeah, it's just, it's, I think, any good athlete at that level, yeah, you, you kind of look at the team surrounding them, and it's always whether it's a strong girlfriend or a strong wife behind them, or a strong brother or a strong team or family. And I think that is just something I could get comfort from as well. You know, it kind of makes it feel like I'm not here alone. You're doing it. You have that support of them, which is, is I mean, and anything about it, they will love me whether I play good or bad. So that is the win win situation there. So I'm um, very grateful and I love them all. They know that. That's awesome. I'm sure your parents are very, very proud to hear you say that. Ben, to the young person who don't have that type of support and now starting off, not as yeah. mature mentally, and what advice you would give them? How? What advice you give them that you don't have that type of, you talk just about financial support, emotional support, but that this person has a drive. They have a dream. They, what advice you give to that person who is now starting off on that journey? I think they um number one, they need to have hope. And I think if they have a dream, they need to go for their dream and work as hard as you can. Um build good relationships are only way with people that you come across. You know, build friendships with people that you never know when they can help you in your life. Being nice to people, having a smile, simple things in life get you a long way, I think, coach. Um, obviously there's a, a lot of people in this world that are very less fortunate and probably don't even have families sometimes to support them but you'll be surprised through sport and life you could then obtain relationships and friendships that will become family you know so I think it's um is a is a good 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 mindset to have to just keep going and trying to achieve your dream trying to just keep keep the whole of hope and um Something will happen if you want it bad enough. Something will happen. Something will happen for you. You know? So you, what you're saying there, Ben, is that, and let's talk about the financial side a little bit. Young person don't have the, the type of support. They don't have the, the maybe the clubs that they need to have. And as you talked about just now, the specs that they need to have. What advice you'd give them in terms of, but I still, I've seen, I've seen golf on television. I've heard about Ben Martin and, and um, Zico Karai and all these guys. And I, I, I heard about Stephen Ames for many years. I feel I could be that person because I love golf. I tried swimming. I tried basketball. I tried football. It didn't work out. How could, how could, how could you, what advice you have to that person who doesn't have it, all the things together just at the beginning, not just the support, but the actual um, equipment that they might need. Well, remember I told you earlier too, eh? it's not the tools, it's the man behind the tools. So if you want it bad enough, like I tell people too, a golf club is a metal club, but on a metal shaft with a rubber grip. Okay, they could get quite 
quite technical and quite finicky. But my first set of clubs, when even when I was quite an avid golfer, my dad bought for me, he left out clubs. So I only got a wedge, eight, six, and four. So he left out clubs in the middle. So I didn't even have a full set of clubs growing up. My father said, when you when I realize you like it and you're playing it more, I'll buy you those other clubs. And he left me with all those clubs for about two years because not only did it make me have to show him that I enjoyed it and give me incentive to want to try and get better and show dad that, hey, I want a set of clubs. It also taught me how to play shots. So to hit a soft eight or a hard, or a hard pitching wedge because I didn't have a nine iron or vice versa, right? So um, I don't find technology should be a, a, a limiting thing for people because you don't need the, the, the high-end, top-of-the-line stuff to get to, to start your golf into career and, and to, to kind of hone your skills. You don't need the best of the best. I mean, it's even football coach. You go back to maybe, I'm sure, Dwight's story. I'm sure he started off with coconuts and dry thing on the beach. And it wasn't a football. He could give him a, a grapefruit or a lime and he will juggle it. So I think it's if your heart is in the right spot and your mind is in the right spot, I don't think that will be a big limitation. Once you want it bad enough, I think things will, will transpire. And then there are things like, like Stephen Ames Foundation and even myself who would love to help people who are less fortunate to come and try the game of golf. I remember Brian Lara said about um, a, a broomstick and a marble. Yeah, and and and, and you know, so think of think of of, of of that that kinetic sense and, and and being able to being able to connect with something yeah. so so small. Stephen Ames, Stephen Ames is, is our best golfer. He's a very successful PGA Tour player now, a champion, some player, proven winner. He he grew up playing golf in in South in in Point of Pay, and the conditions there wasn't very good. He didn't have the best the best equipment or gear or golf course, and. He made it big time. I mean, a little bit later in his career, did he, did he really make it big time? But he didn't have the best of the best, and he has gotten a, been a, had a lot of a lot of success. So, so that, that will bring us to perseverance. You know, being able to persevere in spite of, you know, where there's a will, there's a way, and I think that's really, 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 really important. You know, you, you talked a little earlier about God. How important is God in your life? God is very important in my life. Um, God, God is, it's, I'm not very holy in the sense that I don't go to church every Sunday and I don't go to church every week and all this stuff. And But I don't believe that I need to go to church to talk to God. I um, I say my prayers at home. I talk to him quite often during the day. A lot of times it may be a, a bad drive and I go, thank you God for protecting me there. It's just little things in life. And it's, I think it's, um, yeah, it's not that I know every single prayer and I pray. It's no, I, it's like I'm talking to somebody and it's it's a higher power and Jesus Christ. And I am holy and I do believe in God. But like I said, I don't go to church and practice that very much. But and it, it brings me comfort as well. You know, the archangel St. Michael prayer I find is a very powerful prayer that I use when I'm in a situation that I feel almost heavy and a little intimidating and stuff. I religiously say that prayer, the Our Father. And then talk, I talk to God as like a friend as well, asking for advice and trying to like ask him to make certain, certain things clear for me. And sometimes you might ask for a whole two years and then eventually, bam, it becomes clear. And you say, oh, wow, look, you answer my prayer. Other times, you, you know, it, it don't help at all, but it's still you thinking about what you're trying to do. And it's very important. I think everybody should have somebody and a higher power that they kind of look up to and, and, and pray to. I think is it could only help. So an athlete who is who going to be listening to this interview or is listening right now and says and has a mentality of not being grateful, you know, not showing gratitude, you know, what advice you'd give to them? They not they just well, you guys have to do it for me, right? What you what you what you say to that athlete? Well, you see, I kind of understand well, I, I can't understand not being grateful, but. Like in golf, sometimes I can speak for myself as an individual sport. Sometimes I do have to be slightly selfish. So, in an individual sport, it's you yourself and I, right? You do have to kind of be selfish. The practice hours that you put in, the the time away from my family, from my girlfriend, from my friends, from home, from seeing, just living a normal life. You have to sacrifice and and be selfish to a certain way for that, but. I think gratitude is something they should show every day in life. Just waking up out of your bed and seeing the sun outside 
I think you should be grateful. So, I mean, if people aren't being grateful, I think they need to maybe look at life slightly different because I think even just waking up with a smile and, and being thankful to be alive, I mean, with what's going on in the world around us these days is, is, a, is something to be grateful for, much less being able to swing a golf club, much less being able to play professionally and earn a living out of it. So, I mean, gratitude is something that I show a lot of and I, I have a lot of. And and I think that if people don't have it, they should try and and, and maybe obtain a little more gratitude in their life. For That's sure. well said. That's brilliantly said, Ben. And and of, of, obviously for those of for those who go on to the to the higher, highest levels of the game, we obviously is watching the um the masters behind you. Talk us through a little bit what they are going through, Ben. What those what those top athletes in the world, the Tiger Woods and all the different guys competing there, what are they going through right now? Why? Scotty Scheffler, he amazes me. He's one of the, he's the best player anywhere right now. And if you look at his golf swing, it's a little unorthodox the way his foot movement is and the way he swings and the way he's hitting the golf ball and his, his attitude towards the game and life. And he's a very um holy guy too. He's he's very religious. Um his just his mental state is so so at peace and calm and they they're trying to control what they can control. What they can't control, they can't control. So you can't study what the weather's going to do and what other people are going to do. You have to control what you can do. And I'm sure they have tools and ways through their, their psychologists and stuff that they handle pressure and handle negative thoughts because it's only normal that these things as humans come into your brain and stuff. But I think it's how you deal with it. So you watch every single one of them there. I mean, they're calm. They look cool, calm and collected. But I'm sure inside there's a lot going on. There's tools that they use to get them back into their bubble and I mean, like like me using my acronym WIN, what's important now. So it's a high-pressure situation. They're playing for big money in front of millions of people. I mean, it's behind me now as you speak. It's really tight at the top. It's within one shot. So, I mean, one wrong move here, one wrong move there or it could cost you the tournament. So it's as simple as that. Real, real. They say these tournaments come down to the back nine on the last day. So... The emotions they're going to feel in these last two hours of golf are going to be all. Either the highs of winning or the lows of not playing where they wanted to and, yeah, finishing a little lower down. So taking it into consideration, Ben, the the technical, tactical, the physical, the psychological, what percentage will you put on the mental side of the game? Wow. Like Jack, Jack Nicholas says, and he's one of the best players that came before Tiger Woods, he said golf is 90% mental and the other 10% is mental. <laughs> wow. So it's, I think it's really, really mental. I mean, you look at the players today, right? Dion, if you go down a driving range at any golf tour, PGA tour, DP tour, Live tour, Champions tour, you stand on the driving range, everybody can hit a golf ball. Everybody can hit a chip shot. Everybody can make a putt. But it's who could put together that package and shoot the least amount of scores over 18 holes every day. And sometimes you have all the attributes. I mean, Wyndham Clark is a nice a guy who, who I realize he's so talented on the PGA Tour. And all, all he lost his mom a few years ago. And that really played on his mind. And you could just imagine it's something that big, your mother, losing your mother on your mind. How could you play good golf? So he went to see a psychologist and now he's using that in a positive way, in a positive light. And this man, is going to be unstoppable. He's playing some really good golf. He won, he won the US Open last year. So I think he really is his oyster now once he got between the years recognized and, and organized. And um, yeah, mental game is, is hugely important. Huge. Have you ever been in a situation, Ben, where you're playing and you got some sort of news outside of golf that affected you while you were playing? Has it ever happened? Um, or can you give us an example of, of somebody, another golfer going through the same? I, I have had situations like that, yes, through, um, through a phone call and stuff that have been a little unsettling. And it's funny though, right? Because they say sometimes don't trouble the injured golfer or the wounded golfer, right? Because Remember golf, even though we're out there for five hours or four and a half hours, I only need to concentrate for about 20 seconds over every shot. So if you know how to switch on and off, it shouldn't really affect you that bad. Once you're not thinking about it when you're trying to execute a shot. So 
it didn't really affect me that bad actually because it kind of I kind of knew that hey this might be a distraction so right when I get to my ball my think box and my my bubble is going to be even stronger now because I know that I know where my mind was and I need to get it back here so I think it's how you use these distractions right and I think I experienced enough to to know I mean golf you lose a whole lot more times than you ever win eh, coach you don't win very often in golf so I've had my fair share of losing. I've had my fair share of failures. I've had my fair share of adversity and trials and tribulations. So, I mean, dealing with them is one thing, but knowing how to move on from them and, and accept the next day or the next round of golf is where you have to really get at because you can't change what's happened. So outside of the external motivation, what has... Give us an example, Ben, where something, someone some situation inspired you and you know that really inspired you. Would you, you want to share anything like that? What really inspired me? With, with golf, you say? Yeah. Um, Something at the moment and it just gave you that adrenaline of, hey, and uh, one, positivity. One of my really good friends in England, actually, his name is Marco Penge. He... He just won the Challenge Store Order of Merit last year, which gave him full status, playing status on the DP Tour, the tour that I'm trying to get onto. And I've played lots of golf with him over my career and life. And what's happened here? Okay, so yeah, okay. I played a lot of golf with him in England over my career and our, and our lives together. And it gives me belief that, hey, look, I could do that as well because he was right just with us a couple months ago, and now he's on the tour, you know, making big money and playing for big tournaments, traveling the world, following his son, doing what he loves. So that was a huge inspiration for me, and I'm very proud of him. Um, and I think a lot of times, but the golfing world is so small, coach, that the amount of times you see someone that I've rubbed shoulders with break through on the tour, and you go, hey, look, he could do it, I could do it, man. And there's sometimes people that I think that, hey, I was better than that guy. And look, making making a real good living off of the game. So I think there's a lot of people that kind of inspire me. Even Stephen Ames inspires me, what, he, what he's done in his career. He didn't make it till he was like 37 and then had um, five PGA Tour wins. And now he's the six-time winner on the Champions Tour and doing something he loves into his almost turning 60. So I think that's, that's something in, in golf too. I had a few years where I wanted to be normal. And I would say to dad and mom, I want to wear me normal. I want a normal job. And I, and then I soon realized how lucky I was to be able to play golf and, and play quite well and to be able to make money doing it because uh, eight to four, eight to five is real overrated. <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of realized how grateful I was for golf. I went back quickly into golf. And um, yeah, and I think just seeing others break through and thing has helped motivate me as well to show that it's a dream, but it's not far fetched. It's it's well within my grasp. Now that's awesome. And I'd like the the people who are on with us, if you could um just use the hand raise option if you would like to ask Ben a question as well. All right. So just use the the hand raise option, and I would acknowledge you. Ben, what would you say in terms of? Looking at all the top athletes, so let's look at Trinidad. They, they, and, I, and I may not call, I may not call all of them. And Christopher, I'll come to you in, in, in a little bit. Um, I may not call all of them. So the Dwight Yorks, the Brian Lawrence, the Shaka Hislops, the Karen Forbes, the Dr. Kamasha Robertson, who's now at Man City actually as a psychologist. She played badminton for Trinidad. Um, Atto Bolan, all these different athletes. What is the common thread you would say? to all of them making it? Well, is there a common thread, Ben? I think I think the common thread, it, it stems from the love of the game and the love of the, the sport that they're playing. I think that's the first, that's the true, that's, that's, what's, that's what their foundation was. The love of the game is what caused them to, to start it at a young age and then continue to hone their skills, right? So I think it starts from the love of it and then obviously dedication and commitment and sacrifice and all these things are part of every athlete's life. Because you can't, I mean, today, big raft of down the islands. 
I play golf today. I have a podcast to do it yourself. So there's commitments that I have to do in my life that you can't just pick up and, and live the normal life. Like some of us said to mom and dad, I want to be normal. Well, hey, if you want to be an athlete, before you've made it, you can't be normal. If if you if you want to be normal after you've made it and rock back and think, hey, I've made it now, I can live a normal life. Cool. But when you're trying to make it, you need to work real hard. Real, real hard work and commitment, dedication, sacrifice. And I'm sure all these top athletes have made it from Trinidad and around the world. I've had some some point of that for sure in their career. That's well said. That's well said. Very, very encouraging, I have to say. Um, Christopher, can you unmute and ask your question, please? Yes, sir. Thank you, Dion, for doing this, and um, Ben for being here. Um, so, Ben, how are you doing? Um, it's obvious that you love the game, right? As you said before, you probably were playing, playing since you were four years old. Now, since from four years old growing up, you enjoyed the sport, you had lots of fun. Then the game was on, and you, you got a little more pressure because now you're playing professionally. Now, since you've been playing professionally, do you do you think that affected your your let's let's just say your fun for the game or your enjoyment of it because of that? Not that at all. Type of pressure you have now. I find it even more fun because when you're competing to to play for money, obviously the, the better you do, any more money you win. That becomes fun too, right? So that's like when coach asks if the incentive is winning trophies and money. Well, obviously, why? I mean, why do we go to work on a daily basis to make money to provide, right? So it hasn't taken away my fun from the game at all. But what on the next side of the spectrum, when, because it's so expensive and I sometimes have to fund myself and I get help from friends and the odd donation here and there, but I'm not sponsored. And sometimes putting your hard-earned money that you've worked a whole year for behind 10 tournaments, knowing it's, it's like a, it's, it's, you don't have full control of the outcome, right? So it's a little bit more nerve-wracking than if you had a backing and a team and a sponsorship behind you. But my, my fun of the game now doesn't, has not been affected by turning professionally. If anything, I, I like it more. Like I want to I wanna, I wanna play for more money, for bigger money, on a bigger stage. And I think I, I relish the opportunity when I'm playing in front of a crowd and in front of people. I quite enjoy that to kind of, if you want to say, show off my skills instead of just practicing by myself. So I, I, would, I think that's pretty fun, playing on TV and being able to do this. If that was me right now, that would be pretty cool. You know what I mean? And it's probably fun um, training younger kids as well, too. Probably right. have a good enjoyment with that. Satisfaction as coach, you're gonna tell you. When you see them smiling and they hit some good shots, it's um they get a real feel good feeling for sure. Thank you. Nice, Chris. Nice to see you, bro. Same here, buddy. <laughs> Same here. Great, great, great question, Christopher. Great question. Ben, if you were to go back in time, if you were to go back in time. You know, what would you tell your younger self? If you what advice you'd give your younger self? If you if you're gonna give yourself some really, advice, what advice really, you'd give? That's real easy. I'd say protect your body, protect your knees, protect your your body. Because as a young boy, even I remember my dad, don't jump from the wall. Why are you gonna oh god? And he would because my dad doesn't have the best knees either. He had knee replacements. And I mean, when you're young, they will tell you, Oh God, you you will hurt your knees or you will mash up yourself. And, when you're young, you feel like you're invincible, right? I would have taken a little bit better care of my knees. Well, obviously, with my knee injury, I wish I I wish right now I could sit there with a full, perfect knee. But it's a little bit, you know what I mean? Not not perfect. It's good, but it's not like how Papa God made it, like I said. Now, that's awesome. That, uh, to a young person listening and saying, you know, there's the, there's these there are these dares hope. You know, um, seminars, and oh yeah, and there's Andrew Lewis, and there's Joshua De Silva, and there's all these top athletes in, in Trinidad. But you know what? I don't feel I I could that could be me. I don't know. I don't feel that could be me. You know what advice you'd give them? And let's say there was an easier choice, a wrong choice, but an easier choice to go down the the, the side of crime crime and get into a gang and so. What advice you'd have for them then? I'd, I'd say that uh, uh, leading a life of crime and, and those bad things, 
you live very sore, you die very sore, right? And I don't think it it, it makes sense to to have your your precious life lived so so vulnerable in that that way, right? With crime and how the world is right now. And I think it, it would to, to try and deter them from that, you you give them hope, like you say, you know, there is hope that one day you can, if you keep putting in the work and try to get 0.1% better. I mean, I didn't think I was going to be here one day talking to you on this podcast. I didn't know that. I was pleasantly surprised when I got a call. And sometimes I don't even realize the things I've achieved going forward. But snowball effect, right? Just keep going one thing at a time, one foot in front of the other, 0.1% better. And you never know where, you, where your dream could take you. And it's better off to try and fail and never try at all. So... I'd say if you have something that you want to try and go towards and, and follow your dream, to full on go ahead and do it. Because you live once, life is short. Live it to the fullest, you know what I mean? That's great advice. Great advice. And the reward you get too from when you're... I think all humans have a, have a sense of right and wrong, right? And I think yeah, once you start choosing the right thing and, and doing the right thing, I think it's a kind of snowball effect again, right? The, the, the the angel gets big on your shoulder and the devil shrinks on this one because you're doing your siding with the angel more. So I think, yeah, and, and like I say, God rewards people who do the right thing as well, I think. So do the right thing and try hard and you never know where life could take you. You've won the top golf tournament in Trinidad and, and everybody knows you. You're getting a lot of media press and you go to, whether it's private enterprise or you go to um you know the government or the, the and and you want to get some funding because you need to spend some time at this at this special golf uh academy or golf school and and you get turned down what is that like it's difficult man i mean i i people sometimes think golf is a rich man's sport right and and i'm a white boy and hey yeah we must have money and I mean, it, it does not the case, and it's real hard. And the people who do help me, thanks. I'm forever thankful and grateful for you guys who put your time and effort to support me and invest a little bit of money behind myself, which I'm very grateful for. But, I mean, if you don't ask, you don't get, right? And it, it sometimes gets to a point where you feel like, okay, I ain't going to ask that person again because I don't ask them already or whatever. But you just got to keep going, keep persevering, keep trying, and and... Don't let that don't let that deter you if you if they tell you no. Let that be just a failure and a hurdle that you have to jump over because failures make you stronger, bro. The, the more you fail, is the is the better you're getting, if you know what I mean. Because you don't learn from successes. Successes are when you do things well. When you win a golf tournament, you don't you probably learn more when you miss a cut by one shot than you do when you make the cut and finish 20th. Because you go home and you think. Yeah, you missed that shot, boy. And then you must find you might find 12 shots where you could have made up. But you come 20th in the tournament, then you go home and you're kind of content with that finish. This time you miss the cut and you're real driven yourself because you know you want to come back better. So yeah, it's learning, boy. It's learning and life. And like I say, the advice and what I have to say is just sometimes my opinion too. Someone could could highly disagree with what I say, but it's kind of how I see life and things and Everybody's different, boy, and his life is different. There's everybody different. So I just hope maybe it resonates with a few people and it can help a few people out there. Even if it's one, at least it's better than one. I remember I, I came one time, I was living in Colorado, and um I came down one time and I just ended up on the golf course with um Siko Karai because I keep he kept hearing about how well he was progressing. And we got on the green and there's a pot to make, I would say somewhere between five to 10 yards. And I have to tell you, it looked really, 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 um, really easy. All right, Bali, can you mute your mic, please? Please. Yeah, yeah so just, th thank you. Bali, can you mute, please? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so Ben, and I remember look, looking, looking at it and saying, this has to be the easiest thing in the world. It's right there. Everything looks flat. And I tried it and it was not. Ben talk us through that that actual potting. How the how is that be? Sorry, Ben, you're still there? 
Hello? Yes, Ben. You still uh, sorry, yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so cool. that, that's right. So let me ask the question again. So it looks it's very easy to for to me, it looked very easy to put. Ah, the hole is right there, man. I just have to point this thing there and hit that. And trust me, it was not, it was not good. It was not good at all. You know, tell me, just talk us through that. What is that like? The golf, golf is an outcome game. Golf is a process-minded game. So you have to be engulfed in your process, what you can control, your routines, your start line of your putt, how hard you want to hit it, your swing thought or your technique thought for the day. And you need to focus on your process because the minute your mind starts to run on outcome, you, you've shot yourself because it's a process game. And a lot of times, like I said earlier, you could hit a perfect putt and it lips out and comes out the hole. But if you go through your process well and do that, that's okay. But if you don't go through your process and you, you're studying about outcome, a lot of the time the result isn't there either because you haven't gone through the process to achieve that outcome. And I mean, like an example for you is when I putt. I had a coach tell me when I had like an eight foot putt. So you, you, you really count um, putting in feet because you said five to 10 yards, that's a big difference. That's 15 feet or 30 feet. Okay, so cool. Putt is feet, right? So say I had an eight foot putt. Um, I tell my coach, I'd say, I have to make this putt. Immediately he said to me, he said, well, you've just added pressure to yourself because you said you have to make this putt. He said, what about changing your mindset to I could make this putt if I go through my process correct and if I do my process well and my routine good, I could make this putt. But the minute you tell yourself, and that's one word I've changed in that sentence, just could, just um, I have to, to could. And just changing that word almost takes a little pressure out of me to realize that I don't have to make this putt. It's not life and death. I'm going to die if I miss this putt. But and then you start to build confidence that, hey, let me just go through my process and my routine and let it happen. You can't force it in golf. It's hard enough as it is. There's so many elements to control. You could control what you can and let the rest happen. Oh, well said. Emma, please, unmute and ask, please. Go ahead. Hi, Ben. It's uh, Harry using uh, hey. Emma's phone. How are you doing? Um, yeah, so I just wanted to ask, what would you say to someone who had the chance of making it and was considering giving up? I'd I'd say to them, go and try and eat the four job and see and see what they like. See which one's more fun. But um yeah. I'd I'd say to them, I mean, there's also deciding factors on it, right? Age and money and, and different things that may be holding you back. But if it's just doubt in your mind, I think you should hold on to hope that there is hope, like this um program that we're doing here, that there is hope and stick to your dream, man, because you'd you'd be You'd be kicking yourself later on in life, knowing that you didn't give it an effort and didn't try. And you'd always wonder what if. So I'd say, keep going, boy. Keep going. Because I mean, I, I tried to go and live a normal life and do an eight to five or an eight to four. And I think it's overrated. And yeah. And yeah, and your salary sticks the same. I mean, when you play a professional sport and you break through, you could go from zero to a millionaire in a month, you know, overnight. So keep Keep hope for the dream and, and keep pushing forward because you regret it later in life. I agree. Thank you. Thanks, Az. Yeah, fantastic question. Fantastic question because that's that perseverance and saying, you know, you're not going to give up. You're going to continue going because too many athletes, too many young people, they're almost to the summit, almost to the mountain top, and they they want to give up. They want to give up. They don't want to see it through. Right? And Ben, what is it like, you know, when you're playing and, and, the, and the sun is especially this Trini Sun these days, beating down on you. Is that in your mind? <laughs> you saw my you saw my tan from the sun. <laughs> <laughs> but um perseverance is key boy. You gotta have that perseverance. And sometimes when you feel like you don't want to do it, it it's the, those those two hours where you don't do there that's gonna really you maybe find your biggest gains with, you know? And just, just working out and keep persevering, for sure. And and what are your what are your aspirations for yourself in terms of you've played professionally? How uh, what do you want to do from now still with golf? What, what is there still to, for you to in terms of build, building that legacy and then leaving the legacy? 
Well, there's lot, lots of me to, to achieve yet. I only now starting, even though I say not at age 33. I mean, there's people who are even close to me, even in my family, that that sometimes question and, and say to themselves, wow, you still trying to do this thing, boy? And some to some people, it may th they may think I'm crazy to, to keep trying to, to make it out there and, and achieve my dream and to play on one of the highest levels in the world on the DP Tour, on the PGA Tour. And the reason why I don't think it's crazy is because I know how close I am. So to me, I think it's it's quite achievable and, and not crazy at all. But for people who don't know, to them it may it may look like, wow, this guy really wants to, is he dragging it all longer than it is? Well, no, actually, last year was probably the closest I've ever been to obtaining a full tour card on the DP tour. So, um, I mean, lucky, luckily in golf, your career is a little bit longer than in other sports and you can continue on past your peak, if you want to say, it, past 35, 40, where in normal sports you have to kind of retire. Um, mm -hmm. So you're a little bit lucky in that sense that your career is a bit longer in golf. And during COVID, I started coaching as well. And I, I really enjoy coaching. My true love, obviously, is playing and competing the game. Um, but if later on in life I wanted to hang up the sticks and my competitive golf, I can always go into opening a golf school and, and really taking my coaching to the next level and, and working on the future generation and hopefully bettering golf as a sport and in our country. And we talked a little earlier about gratitude. In terms of, as sports people, I remember one time there was a, a little kid, um, uh, Dominic Amoroso. He had a tumor growing growing at the back of his neck. Oh, well, actually, yeah. yeah and he was g g going, and I remember without even a phone call, I turned up to Brian Lara's house and said, Brian, there's a little one there that needs some motivating. And Brian stopped what he was doing and came, we went straight to the hospital. I didn't call him anything. I just said, I'll take the chance until he was home. How important it is for athletes like yourself at the top of your game, you know, world famous, to give back in that way? I think it's, I think it's huge because um, just, just showing people that, again, there is hope and that, look, people do care about you and, and see your talent and that you're not nobody. You are somebody and, and you deserve the right to, to do what you love, just like we had the right to, or the, the chance to do what we love. So I think expiring the, the young ones and people who need that motivation is is something that, just like Brian, I would do without even thinking, without even thinking twice about it, you know, to motivate somebody else, for sure. Because I know Dylan Carter, from chatting with Dylan Carter, Dylan is the same way, you know, to, 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 go, to go to see somebody in a hospital, to talk to them, it's not a problem at all. They really, he sees the need that, you know, hey, if I have to go and help this person, I have no problem doing that charitable work. Because, you know, sometimes, and Ben, you have met, a, not hopefully there are not many, where, hey, I don't want to do that. I, I'm in this sport, I'm good, I'm famous, but to go and do that side of it, you know, what advice you would just, to, if, if you were to give some advice to that person to do that charitable work, and that might just be the catalyst for them, what, what would you say to them, Ben? Yeah, I, I would say that that is very important. Um, I used to have a coach, Lee Vanett, from Scotland, who came down to Trinidad to kind of nurture our junior team. And somebody made a comment about, oh, a pro -am. I don't want to play any pro -am. If you're the pro, why you have to play with three amateurs for? So all of us thought about it. And Lee said, Lee said, well, funny enough, that is very important. And we all kind of said, well, why is it important? That's three amateurs and he's the pro. Well, why it's important is because you're also marked in yourself and you don't know where these people later on in life will come back and help you and see that your gracious move to, to talk to somebody and motivate somebody. And you never know when, when it will come back to you. They may turn out to be your head sponsor. They may turn out to be the doctor of your dying mother who saves your mother. So you never know where life can take you. And as I say, just treat everybody how kind of you want to be treated, you know? Well, that's brilliant and very inspiring. Um, ben, anybody would like to ask a question, please? Anybody would like to just raise, use the raise hand option. We almost finished, but anybody would like to ask a question? Because Ben said, uh, let me see quite a few things that is very, very encouraging. But is there a question that you feel, I wonder what he thinks about this or thinks about that? Is anybody, please? Let me know. Any Anything. Don't feel shy. I move seat coach because my phone is going to die. So I'm just... No, that's seat. fine. That's fine. 
And we have, I hope I, I hope I have the name correctly, Barney Pacheco. Barney, okay. please go ahead. Thank you. And, and thanks to Ben for a lot of inspirational words this evening, this afternoon. Um, I, was, I was actually curious, what is one of your proudest moments from your competitive career where you actually didn't win, but that you're most proud of? I'll be very curious to hear some insight. Um, I would say last year, I think it would have to be my 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 showing in the qualifying school last year to get on the DP World Tour. Um, it's a really, really tough battle. There's three tournaments to get through, to get to to final stage. I unfortunately, like you said, I did not get the icing on the cake because I slenderly missed out in a playoff. Um, but the way I carried myself and the, the scores that I shot, I was 10 on the par for first stage of Q school and came second. And then in, in the second stage, I was eight on the par for four days on a really tricky golf course in Desert Springs in Spain. My mental game was really, really good. I I hit a few poor shots here and there, yes, but it's the way I recovered and and how I dealt with adversity and 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 the conditions. And I was on the bad side of the draw. And um I think I could take a lot of positivity from that and from my performance there. Um, knowing that I can do it when it matters and in tough conditions. Even though I didn't get the end result that I wanted, um, it was a very positive experience. And even the way I carried myself, I kinda I kinda overlooked that. I didn't realize how good my attitude was. It was only until I went the next week to the final stage and there was like three or four tour reps that came up to me and said, Hey, Mr. Martin, hey, from Trinidad, right? They said, man, the way you carried yourself, I was very proud of you. And it kind of made me feel proud. I said, wow, you know, I didn't even realize that I was that kind of chilled about it because there was a situation where you could have been quite upset about, right? Um, but I think that was a proud moment for me. And then other than that, when I have had have had successes, obviously it's easy to feel proud when you've had success. Um, but even like in... um the Jamaica Open after having a rough a rough first day coming third afterwards was another good performance that I was proud of after starting off with a, with a kind of shaky first day but I think last year really tops it off at that Q school because that was basically playing with some of the best players in the world and I was just skin on your teeth away from, from making it out there and hopefully this year it happens for me that, so we could have a nice success story to talk about that's pretty inspirational thank you thanks man very, 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 Mr. Pacheco, very inspirational. He took the words out of my mouth. That's 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 excellent. That's excellent. Because Ben, anything you know, you talked about it just now. You're, you're most welcome, sir. Most welcome. Um, you talked about Ben. Um, you know, at your at your spot, you know, you, you you're not stopping at 30. You could go on for a while. You could go on for a while. When do you think, Ben, that you might say, look, this is it for me? Or there's, I'm, I'm not that I'm planting a seed or anything, like that, but has there been a thought that okay, when I get to 55 or when I get to this or whatever, is that have you ever thought that way? Not really, coach. I I think as long as I'm healthy, God spare life, and I'm healthy and willing and able, I think I'll continue to play golf for the rest of my life. Um, it may not it may not end up being at a professional level all my life, but I will definitely still play golf all my life. Um, once I can, God willing, and. I mean, if I could do it competing and professionally all my life, as long as I'm able, I will hopefully be doing that. For I sure. Know, I know you have a few family members on. Is there? I want. I want to put one of the family members on this spot. What inspires you about Ben? What did Ben do that that inspires you? Something that in, inspired you that you're so proud of Ben? Can somebody unmute uh, uh, one of his family members? They're on his spot. Yeah, let me see them. I saw Timmy. I don't know if Timmy, Timmy, your brother is here, but I saw Timmy just now just came in. But something yeah, that, is, that, that that inspires you. Any one of the, the family members would like to do that? But I know I'll put you guys on this spot. Some... Oh, God, come on. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, something God, they that... got shy. They got shy. <laughs> they got Hi, mom. Hi, mom. No, it's mom? not mom. It's Sammy. <laughs> oh, it's Sammy. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Dion. Hi, Samantha. Great. Um, How are you, Sammy? Good. If you hear noise in the background, it's the kids as usual. Okay. Um, I think one thing about Ben that has always motivated me, and I think it's quite inspiring to see, is 
he's always positive. Like he'll have a bad day, he's still finding positive in it. He'll have a good day and he's like ecstatic. But no matter hello high water, he's always kept a really positive go forward kind of get it attitude. Yeah. And I think that has really helped to kind of help him persevere in the sports. Like it can be really daunting to just think that, you know, is this my career path? Is this where I'm going to be? Right. But right. he's yeah. been so positive and I think that's helped him to kind of build up where he is and to build the reputation and the success that he has. Thanks, Sammy. That's me. <laughs> Thank you. Nice words. I appreciate it. That's fantastic. That's fantastic because, you know, to stay, to, in spite of all, in spite of all, Ben, to, to stay focused, to stay positive and, and that, you, you know, you're going to still continue despite you know, as you say, um, just now you said something which is quite interesting where you said um, you, you you will actually fail a little more than you will actually succeed. But to still get up the next day and say, I'm going to play again. I'm going to go out there again. Yeah, correct. As you drive, you need, I guess, boy, right? In every way, I mean, in, in, a, in, a lot, in, in all walks of life, I think, and in, in a lot of things in life, in business too, in, in everything, in relationships, in your life, and. In, in everything, I think you need to have that kind of outlook. Glass half full instead of half empty, you know what I mean? That's well said. That's well said. And and Ben, what I want you to do now is, is to, you're going to address the young people of our nation and give them, because, I'm uh, you know, a lot of people are going to see this, this interview. What advice you'd have for young people of our nation, in our nation? Um... First, first of all, I, um, to to stay off the streets and stay off, stay in school, not dropping out of school. I like you to stay in school, get your education, show respect and and love to your your elders and people, and treat the bin man, the garbage man, like you would treat your prime minister, and um, just manners and respect and 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 having good good um. Let's see what I'm looking for. Good routines in life, good practices, you know, just trying to do the right thing more than the wrong thing. And because a lot of times we do know what's right from wrong, right? So just just good practices, you know, and, and manners and respect and, and these stuff is is hugely important and it'll take you a long way than than the contrary to that, you know. So I think um having having good manners and respect and being a nice person and 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 having goals and, and ambition in your life will, will always hold you in good stead than just being on the streets or sitting on the block or drinking beers by a bar, you know? Okay, wow. That that's that speaks volumes because as as you know, Ben, a lot of our young people, you know, they 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 have hope. You know, there's hope, but sometimes there's the who who are they listening to? I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't. And, and you know, they go through the, they go through these times when there's that doubt, you know. So so yeah. how can so we there was a, there's a little story I'll give you on that same topic and then and then I done. Um there was a young boy in the village in Maraval who you can see he was I knew him a long time and him since a little boy running around the streets and right. And you can see that he's not a bad boy, he just on the streets and he you know, he just doesn't have any direction. And I said to him, I said, look, you want to start caddying? I say, if you want to get into golf, the first way and the easiest way, and I think, is start to caddy. You start to learn the game. And through yeah. caddying, you get to use the golf course on a Monday. And so said, so done. This guy came, started caddying, and now he's he's at the golf club quite often and has a, has a means of way making money somewhere near to where he lives. Caddying also gets to play golf every Monday for free. And you never know where I could take him in his life, who he might meet carrying for, he might carry for someone who then gives him a better job. Or so you never know where things go. And I just keep yourself keep yourself active and proactive and doing the right things and opportunities will arise if you put yourself in the in the situation more. That's very very, very inspiring. Very inspiring. Ben on behalf of of, of uh myself and, and, and all of the folks at the There is Hope. Um, show that helps us to put this show on. I would like to thank you for taking the time out, you know, of your schedule. And you know, as you say, you could have gone down the islands, but you decided to come and do to to come and do, you know, share with us quite a bit of of your journey. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I want to encourage you to keep doing what you're doing because, as you already know, um, I'm preaching to the choir. Um, 
you guys are an inspiration, regardless of whatever sport. You're an inspiration to the young people of Trinidad and Tobago, and there is hope. And 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 as as folks, as you as you just heard Ben say, you know, keep persevering, keep persevering. Set your set your set your routines, set your routines, and don't doubt yourself. Try not to doubt yourself. Sure. And I love how you talked about Ben about don't worry about not having the right equipment. You know, it's the person behind the tools, and uh, that's what I'm going to borrow from you, Ben. It's yeah, the man, person, for sure. The person behind the tools, you know, so. Really, well, thank, really thanks inspirational. A lot. Thanks a lot to you as well, Coach. As I don't know if the viewers may know, but we go back a, a really long way. So um, I appreciate it and taking your time out to also interview me with some of these prolific athletes in Trinidad that hopefully I can be as prolific as in my future coming as well. And um, you never know, next time it might be a bigger podcast and this time we're on TV. Nah, that's cool. And that'll be, that'll be awesome. That, that'll be, that's inspiring for me too. So that's, that's awesome. Yeah, and and my my I really enjoy hearing you guys speak. Really, really enjoy hearing you guys speak. And because you, as, as you said it earlier, we are all human, and it didn't just happen for us. You know, there was Correct. steps along the way, and so really, really Adversity inspiring. Adversity and all these things, yeah, that that mold you into the person you are, yeah. yeah. Correct. Thank you very much. Was no. there anybody who would like to unmute and say anything, please? I see Auntie Anna take. God keep coming on Auntie, one of my aunties, but I don't know if she wants to say anything. <laughs> oh, which auntie? <laughs> I see Auntie Caroline here now too. Oh, I'm God. yes. We're very proud of you, Ben. We're proud of Thanks, your perseverance, auntie. and we're Appreciate proud of it. you being who you are. You, you, Thank your you. own man. So keep going, Ben. We're all behind you. Thanks, Auntie Caroline. Yeah, coach. Um, sorry, I didn't figure out how to do my my microphone there, but now figure it out. I'm Timmy. And, and I play golf myself today and obviously growing up playing with Ben, he's been inspiring to me, friends, a lot of people. So having carried for him and compete with him, yeah, he's just inspiring to a lot of people and it's good to see the drive and determination he has. So That's just how to keep putting real. his head down and doing it. Yeah, man, for sure. That's so fantastic, yes. Timmy. So fantastic. That is that so fantastic. Anybody else before we close? Um, I'd like to say something. This is Kirk. Hey, I'm Kirk. Um, Kirk, how are you doing, bro? How are you going? You good? Yeah, you? I'm excellent. Um, I just want to say, Ben, in case you don't know, you're a very, very good inspiration to everybody. Um, I utilize your life and what you've gone through and adversities with a lot of my fighters. Um, to show them examples of perseverance and, you know, something to keep in mind, you know, without the bad, you can't appreciate the good. Correct. And I've seen you come from so far to where you are now. And I'm very proud you said it earlier, it doesn't matter how well you do, although I think you could stick it to the moon and back. You're now inspiring the youth and that's what everything is based upon for the future. And, um, just super proud of you, and I know how hard you try, and you're going to get there. Just keep persevering. Thanks, and so much. You'll do it. Very proud Thank of you. you. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Take care. Take care. That's inspiring words for sure. You know, so, again, on behalf of myself and, and the Dare is Hope motivational series, Ben is such a, a fantastic... <laughs> I forgot it. It was three o'clock. I forgot. Mute it, Auntie. Mute it. No, that's what fine. That's... <laughs> Uncle Kirk's muted. But anyway. Yeah, that's fine. Oh, that's sorry, fine. sorry. I don't know. No, it's all right. That's fine. So again, Ben, thank you very, very much for, for being on. You're an inspiration and you will continue to be an inspiration to, to not only the youth of Tran Tobago, but to the to the citizenry of Tran Tobago. Everybody's looking, you know, is looking at you and keep doing what you're doing. Proud of you, buddy. And I want to wish you, you all the best moving forward. And our friend your golf lesson, eh? So everybody can hear. So whenever you want your golf lesson, come and check me. I'll I'll, I'll be there, buddy. We, we, we'll talk soon. I'll be there. <laughs> I really good. appreciate it. So everybody, everybody have a fantastic day. And and again, Ben, thank you very much. Have a wonderful Thanks day. Thanks a lot, Coach John. I appreciate it. Bye, You're everybody. Welcome. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.